Good afternoon, everyone. Guys, we have less than 24 hours left. World War Three update. Things are going absolutely wild all over the earth. And you wouldn't notice it if you was watching mainstream media. Seems to me there's been a block out, a blackout. Looks like the only thing that people are reporting on at the moment is domestic policies. In the United States, it looks like all people are focused on, and I guess quite rightly so as well, is the United States election. We'll come on to that. And in the United Kingdom, all people are talking about is the budget. Meanwhile, the rest of the world is in absolute flames. We're moving closer to a day or a time or something where people just look around and say, guys, guess what? I guess we're actually in World War Three, and we've probably been in it since the 1st of October. Now, guys, before we go on this video, I want to just tell you about a conversation I recently, well, uh, this afternoon, actually, with my dad. My dad phoned me up and he said he'd just been walking the dog um, at a reservoir near where, um, well, if you guys can remember the uh, for the protests at, in, at the Rotherham Migrant Hotel in, I think it was in August, just behind that there is a, there's a reservoir and there was a lot of reports of uh, certain things going on in that reservoir. A lot of young girls were scared of walking there, but, you know, now the migrants have moved out, people are, people are walking in that area again. So my dad says to me, I had a conversation with uh, with a police officer. He said, he saw these two police officers and they looked fat. They looked unfit. You know, their bellies were poking out. He didn't look, you know, their shoelaces were untied. And he, so he just went over to them and just, you know, decided to be polite and, and have, have a conversation with them, you know, see what the crack was. So he's gone over there and I... He, most reservoirs, like you've probably got the same near where you live. You know, there's a reservoir. You can go sailing on it. You can rent kayaks. You know, there's a little walkway all the, all the way around it. And, you know, there's a little cafe there. So my dad, he just went over and he spoke to the policeman. And the way my dad was talking, it was absolutely wild. Bear in mind, my dad phoned me up a couple of, like, last week, uh, maybe the week before last. And he told me he's moving now. They're selling up and they're moving to Benidorm. So he was talking about this police officer he was talking to. And it turns out this police officer was Romanian and English wasn't his first language. So it was difficult to talk to him. Now, I think it's great that a Romanian has managed to pass the high bar of the British, uh, the British police and managed to get himself in as a British police officer. But guys, you know, we were talking about this and right now it seems like there's an active push to, you know, to persuade people that would normally join the police not to join the police. And when this happens, who is going to fill those ranks? When I started these channels, um, you know, you guys were putting in the comments that, you know, we're going to have a migrant police force. And I was like, oh, I, I struggle to see that. But the closer we move forwards to wherever it is we're going in this, you know, in this time machine that we all live on, I'm starting to see that I really am because it makes perfect sense. If you've got a migrant police force, they're just going to do as they're told. They will literally, <coughs> excuse me, they will literally do whatever they are told by whatever politician is in charge. There'll be no fair and free policing. There'll be no policing by, um, you know, there'll be no police officers coming out thinking, OK, I know the community and I know what's under, I understand what's happening here. I want everybody to go back. You know, it will just literally be policing of the most draconian measures. Now, if you guys remember back in 2020, when all these draconian laws were put on us, you know, to stop us, to stop having gatherings of, I think, what was it, more than six or something, and we had to stay six feet apart and all the rest of the wild stuff, you can understand that moving forward, who is going to enforce that if it's just absolutely absurd? Who's going to, you know, who's going to come around and enforce this? Well, you know, I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm saying it looks more likely now that this could happen than it did four years ago. And that is just me keeping an eye on things and looking what's happening around the world and looking what's happening domestically. So anyway, guys, before we go on and as we're talking about this, I just want to share a few articles with you guys. Let me just make sure I've got these in order. One, two, three, four, five, six. I've got six. 
Yeah, we've got six. So we've got six. And what I'm gonna do, guys, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna share this share the screen with you, and then we'll just talk. I'll just talk a little bit about each one. I won't go into the articles because the articles are quite difficult to read, but I will share I'll share the articles and I'll of course put these articles in the description. So where are we? So when we're talking about, you know, the problems of mass uncontrolled migration, you know, a lot of people are saying that migrations are net good for the communities because it brings jobs, it brings expertise. You know, a lot of these people that are coming over to the United Kingdom, they're doctors, they're engineers, they're, you know, lots of humanity that are coming over to the United Kingdom. Now, there's a lot of evidence out there at the moment, and a lot of this evidence would be classed as, I guess, misinformation. Now. We've obviously got to be mindful of misinformation because the problem the problem is when people say the wrong things. And if you've got a big account on social media, that really can happen. But also, who decides what misinformation is? Who decides when something's right or when something's wrong or you know, like we've experienced ourselves with our platforms, you know, we've only got relatively small platforms at the moment, but we've been, we've had lots of videos taken down because, you know, our videos are deemed misinformation. Now, a lot of the videos we share, uh, sorry, a lot of the videos we produce are from information I'm getting from, you know, people out in Ukraine, people out in the Middle East who are telling me things and I can say, hey, mate, can I, can I share this? And he's saying, yeah, but you can share it, but don't don't mention my name, obviously, or don't mention this town or don't mention this city. And of course, you know, if somebody gives me information in confidence, you know, and, and I ask them if I can share it, I will, obviously with their permission, because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to you know, I don't want to incriminate anyone, you know, because once you start incriminating people and, and people just don't share things with you. And if people don't share things with me, I can't share those things with you. And if I can't share those things with you, guess what? The only way that you guys get information is off the good old, um, what is it? The good old Beeb. And we all know how biased those guys are. So, we're looking here, guys, you know, just some articles that have been released. I got a lot of these. Uh, someone shared these on X. So that's kind of the situation in the United Kingdom at the moment. We're, we've got this we've got this weird, weird situation where we're being told one thing and we can actually see another thing happening. Now, I've given a lot of videos into why I think this is happening, you know, and why I think this is going to, well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you now, you know, the problem with misinformation, and it is a real problem, is I could say, you know, aliens in green suits are coming down and they're, you know, and they're stealing everyone's tinfoil. Whereas that, you know, that may or may not be true. The reality is until that's come out on a few, you know, on I think it's two mainstream media outlets, that is misinformation. Now, if I said that and that caused mass panic, mass hysteria, I don't know, people bulk buying tinfoil, you know, that, you know, the government, that would be causing distress and causing alarm unnecessarily. Now, the problem is who decides this? We've already seen that, you know, from the mainstream that, sorry, my nose is gin. Uh, we've already seen from the mainstream that the um, the incident in Stockport was delayed getting all this information out because of potential civil unrest with the Chris Carver ruling. So now you see politicizing the release of information when I think the, you know, the policy should just be let information go and let people decide. And guess what? You know, if people are angry, if people are not happy, that's okay too. If people want to protest, that's okay too. If people want to vote for a different party, guess what? That's okay too. Because what you have is you have these policies that are put out there and they're put in place. They're not done to, you know, they're not done to protect the public that I believe. I believe they're done to protect the votes. So anyway, guys, you know, what's been happening around the world? A lot. So let me just come straight onto the, uh, let me just go straight onto the, uh, onto the share map. Because the situation in Ukraine, it is absolutely bonkers right now. You've got the Russians taking ground on a daily basis. So, guys, this is from the 24th. Now, I know I did this, I think, yesterday. But I, I want you to concentrate on this region down here. So you've got Pokrovs up here. You've got uh, Selidov. 
Uh, yes, Ellie Dove. So just watch, watch the areas that the Russians are taking and just note how much ground the Ukrainians are pushing them back in. I mean, this is just in the space of a few days. So like I said, now Selidov has fall. That was kind of one of the last strongholds. You know, what you're going to see is you're going to see this big push now from the Russians. And we've got a lot of people in Russia talking now about the time right now is one of the biggest pushers in the Ukraine war. And it's kind of, you know, like we said would happen that I think this big push has actually started in Ukraine. Ukraine war latest. Ukraine facing one of Russia's most powerful offensives since the start of all-out war. So what they're talking about there is since 2020. Ukraine facing one of Russia's most powerful offensives since the start of the all-out war. North Korean soldiers sent to Ukraine border are equipped with standard infantry and military equipment. Locations of Ukrainian weapon systems revealed on Google Maps. Um, 30 missiles at Ukraine over the last week, Zelensky says, Ukraine to produce anti-drone missiles with Belgian manufacturer. So I don't know why the mainstream media in the United Kingdom is not reporting on this. Remember, what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks we're going to see mass movements on all these fronts. Again, guys, let me caveat this. This is my, my speculation, my analysis, and a lot of this is my own opinion. But let's look at the facts. Let's look at what's happening on the ground. In the European, in the European theater, the Ukrainians can't back down. And the Ukrainians can't back down because they're being propped up by the Europeans, by Europe. The Europeans can't back down because if the Europeans back down, it will be a total collapse of the euro because emerging countries will no longer put their currency in the euro. They will just go to the euro, uh, the ruble, the yen, you know, something else. They will want to join the BRICS trading nation. In the Middle East, the Israelis can't back down because the, if the Israelis back down, they're going to show weakness, they're going to falter and they're going to fail. Remember, the Israelis are backed by the United States. So what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks? What I think you're going to see is, remember when I did the video on, let me try and find it now, guys. I should have got this actually. I should have got this one up, guys, but let me just get this. Um, where are we? Where are we? There was a group called Iranians for Trump. Where is it, guys? Um, there was a there, basically there was a there was a group out called Iranians for Trump. Ah, here it is, guys. Let me just share this with you real quick. Because this is important when you're looking at things and how they're going to move forwards. So Iranians on the U.S. election 2024, Trump or Harris. So when Trump, right. So basically, guys, there's this group out there. I, that's not the right article, but there is an article out there somewhere. And it's this group in America called Iranians for Trump, which is exactly what it says on the tin. A lot of people who fled Iran in like 79 and they are pro-Trump, pro-democracy, and they want Iran back to the way it used to be. Now, I notice I, I i identified this quite a while ago and i said guys listen you know you we need to watch what happens with this group iranians for trump because now in iran you're seeing an emergence of people protesting on the streets of iran people like there's this woman protesting naked because of the way because she had a she was wearing a, as i understand it she was wearing her hijab incorrectly and she got told off at the university she was at. So she did. Uh, so she's done a protest by walking around in her underwear. Look at the media attention that is getting. Like that shouldn't really have any media attention, should it? Now you've got to understand where the mainstream media put their focus. That's because they're being told to put their focus. Why? Because they get paid to do that. Guess what? You know, if you're not. If you're not buying, sorry, if you're not buying something, if, if you're not buying something, then you are, you are the product. So when it becomes, when you're talking about media, you are the product because you watch that media and that media alters your opinion. You know, I could, I should do an episode where I just change the headlines of all the articles, you know, and give it, give them a totally different spin. Uh, I might do that now, guys, actually in real time, but 
you've got to see where the mainstream me how the mainstream media are reporting this woman naked in Iran. Now the the story shouldn't really be making any media. It shouldn't really have any media um, input at all because it's kind of a non-story. Woman in Iran walks around in her underwear. What what kind of a story is that? But there, it's been developed and it's growing organically. This is one of those things where I always say you've got to look what's growing out of the weeds. And this is one of those things that's growing out of the weeds. So we're going to see this develop. And over the next couple of weeks, I think, I actually think my time frame for this wasn't aggressive enough. Because thinking about it now, this needs to happen early on in Trump's presidency. And again, you know, I may be wildly wrong, but I'm putting myself out there on public record and I'm going to say this is going to happen. You're going to see in Iran within the next, you know, pretty early on in, in the Trump presidency, you're going to see a movement growing in Iran and it's going to be called Iranians for Trump. It's going to be called Iranians for democracy. It, it doesn't really matter what it's called, but you will see this group grow. And remember, when you're subverting an enemy country, you don't need that much effort if that country wants to go that, that way anyway. I mean, yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll come back onto Western subversion in a minute. But when you're look, when you're talking about um, subverting a hostile enemy or a hostile country, you know, if they're going that way anyway, or they want to go that way anyway, they only need a little push. They only need a feather touch. They only need funding in certain groups. You know that can get placards out, that can get movement, that can get a few fundamentalists who are willing to get put in prison. You know, those in, in Russia, you would call them useful idiots. You know, you only need a, a few of those people before, you know, you reach critical mass and everyone's out on the streets. Everyone's out protesting. So pretty early on in the Trump presidency, and I'm assuming that he's going to win. So pretty early on what you're going to see. And again, even if Trump doesn't win, which I don't see how he can't win right now when you're looking at Kamala Harris. But early on in this presidency, what you'll see is this growing movement of and again, what the name is, it doesn't really matter. But you'll see people in Iran waving United States flags, waving, you know, flags saying they want democracy. They want, you know, they want a change of the way they're being ruled. And you will see draconian measures brought against them. You will see hard things brought down on these people. And then there'll be an international outcry. Don't forget, all the time that this is happening behind the scenes, what you're going to see is Israel at war with Iran. Israel at war with Lebanon, Israel still with the conflict in uh, on the Gaza Strip, Israel fighting, you know, potentially fighting targets in Yemen. And then you're going to see more rhetoric about this resolution 599. I think it's called House Resolution 599 or 559. I, do a search for it. It was passed on the 1st of November 2023. This was a bill that basically gave the United States the green light to go to war with Iran. And these are these little documents that get passed, that go under the radar, that nobody seems to notice. And these are the things that people will rely on. So then the United States will come out and they will say, well, guys, listen, you know what? A, you know, a, a nuclear armed. So the House Resolution 599 or 559, I can't remember which one it is. It says that, you know, a nuclear armed Iran is unacceptable to the United States and that the United States support anyone in that region who will want to take down um, the Iranian uh, nuclear capacity. It, it's quite a broad document, but basically it says Iran bad can't have nuclear weapons. So then we're going to see more rhetoric about Iran having nuclear weapons, Iran being able to, I don't know, and I'm speculating here, Iran being able to um, produce their own tritium, Iran being able to produce some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of nuclear material. You know, there's evidence of it. There's Israeli intelligence of it. There's American intelligence of it. You know, somebody's got intelligence that the Russians gave it them. Doesn't matter, but the rhetoric will be that on the streets of Iran, there will be protests and people wanting pro-democracy, pro-democracy rallies, and they'll be dealt with draconianly. That'll get the people on board. And then there'll be the rhetoric about the nuclear, you know, the nuclear rhetoric building up. All this time, you know, there'll be missiles being launched into Iran by Israel, um, into Israel by Iran. There'll be casualties on all sides and America will slowly be drawn into this conflict. 
the only people in the world, I don't care what anyone says, the only country in the world that has the capacity right now for a land invasion is America. They have all the amphibious landing craft. They have the naval assets. They have the air assets. They have the men, the machinery, the manpower. You know, they have the whole shebang. Nobody else can do that. Russia can't do that. China can't do that. You know, do we have any, like the Indian? Nobody can do that with any significant, um, you know, in any significant numbers. And to take out the Iranian nuclear facilities, guess what? you're going to need boots on the ground. Why? Because in 2003, there was overwhelming air power went into Iraq and it devastated Iraq. So the Iranians will have learned from that mistake, guys. You know, and I've said this so many times, all the Iranian military, uh, anything of any star asset, asset value will have been put deep, 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 deep underground. By deep underground, I mean underground these mountains. So you think about trying to bomb a deep underground military base. Okay. Now you try bombing a deep underground military base that's underneath a mountain from the air. You're not going to do it. You would literally have to bomb the mountain out of the way. And I know some of you guys are saying that some of some, you know, US Air Force hold my beer. Guys, you know, it's just not going to happen because once you have that much rubble, it doesn't matter. Each each new detonation, you're just hitting rubble. You're just causing you're just causing more rubble, and it, you don't actually get any deeper. There will be um, bunker busting munitions. There will be bunker busting systems, and there will be a number of uh, strikes you can do to get further down in these locations but there's a limit to that you know there is a limit to that the iranians will know this and they will have just dug deeper down so that's what you will see that's the rhetoric that's going to build up from the united states in the next couple of months now the united states election I honestly, I, I, I got a comment saying, how can I support the West and support democracy when I want Donald Trump to win? And if Donald Trump wins, he's going to pull funding. I, I've said this, you know, he's going to pull funding from Ukraine. This is a this is a process that's happening in the world. And I've certainly got no say over over this happening at all. But what you've got to understand is we're not fighting. We're not fighting people as much as we're fighting the human condition. Now, the human condition. And if any of you have read that book there, you know, the opening word in that book, it talks about the it talks about the actual human condition. And like, guys, look, we have eyes in the front of our heads. We are apex predators. We are engineers, explorers, pioneers. You know, we drive things forward. We make things better for ourselves. We compete over resources. And it's that competitivity that drives us to absolute fantastic things. It drives us to building spaceships. It drives us to, you know, medical advancements. I'm talking advancements like MRIs, vaccines, you know, the ones that work, you know, penicillin. You know, it drives us to build and create fantastic things. But it also inevitably drives us into war. And right now we are due a war. And that's if you look at, you know, if you look at the cycles, fourth turning, if you look at all these things put together holistically, we are due a global conflict of an industrial scale. Now, it's all well and good people thinking, oh, we can avoid war. We, we can't. It's part of our nature, guys. It really is. You know, it is part of human nature. Now, at the end of this, when this when this conflict stopped and it's over, you know, we'll rebuild and we'll prosper and we'll advance humanity. Hopefully we'll get to another planet, maybe the moon first. We'll have a base on the moon. Then we'll go out to Mars, maybe a sky base around Venus. And then we can look at building O'Neill cylinders, maybe a Dyson sphere, all sorts of fantastic stuff. But right now we just have to look at what's happening and we just have to get it over with as quickly as possible because... It, you know, and, and I, I'm not one of those people who's who's like, like, you know, you get people who who really are warmongers because they've never seen these conflicts. They've never seen they've ne never seen the devastation of families, you know, moving out of their house because their house has just been blown up. You know, bodies lying in the streets, people losing their friends, people losing their family. People have never seen this. And a lot of these people are the ones who are warmongering, the politicians, the people who are in large military uh, arms com um, companies. They're the ones who are banging this drum 
I would personally much rather we use our competitivity to reach for the stars, to go to space, take asteroids, you know, do all that sort of stuff. People can still make in more than enough money by asteroid mining, exploring space. But the problem is it's not profitable. And because it's not profitable, it's not going to it's not going to happen. Now, we could use that. Um, you know, we could use the competitivity to do that. We really could. But we're not going to because we are where we are. And we kind of can't change that. You know, you just got to look at the conflicts all around the world at the moment. So that's kind of what's going to what's going to be happening and why we can't get around that. So that's in the Middle East. Now, in the European theater, remember, guys, you know, remember months ago when I was talking about this divergence that is happening in the United States will focus in the Middle East. It's going to happen, you know. And so, yeah, sorry. So when people say, you know, why, how can I support, you know, want Trump to win when he's going to pull funding from Ukraine? Well, you know, this is just one of those things that's inevitable. You know, I, you know, if like I, I have a lot of friends who have vastly different opinions to me. They're still my friend, but I totally disagree with them. I say, listen, that's not right. You know, but, you know, it's just one of those things. The United States can't fight a war on two fronts just yet, you know. They're going to have to deal with the threat in the Middle East and then potentially look for a threat uh, for the Chinese threat afterwards. I think the Chinese threat, when that comes online, that will be a coalition of the United States, uh, Australia, Japan, South Korea and uh, New Zealand. Who else is in that region? That will be their area of responsibility. And that will mainly be a naval conflict in the South China Sea. Um the naval conflict, it has to be a naval conflict because the United States will already have its manpower ex expressed, um, exploited in Iran. The United States, nobody wants a ground invasion into China. It would be an absolute nightmare. China's too populous, it's too thick, it's too dense. It would be an it would be absolute carnage. The Chinese in the South China Sea in that region, like I, I'm trying to keep this real short for you guys as well, you know. Again, the Chinese have never been tested in combat. The Chinese have never been tested. Their military has never been tested. The United, guess what, though? The United States, they definitely have been tested. Uh, NATO have been tested. Britain have been tested. Other countries have been tested in active combat. So the, chi the conflict in China, sorry, the, I'm saying it like it's happened. If there's a conflict involving China on one side and a coalition on the other side, that will be predominantly a naval conflict. Now, if this is fought in the South China Sea, which if you're looking at the if you're looking at a, a catalyst for this as an invasion of Taiwan, then that would that, it would be that region. <clears throat> what you've got to understand is the manufacturing capacity of China. So China have an almost infinite amount of rockets. So a lot of those rockets, though, they are pretty, they're dumb rockets in the context that they have to be guided by GPS, which means they have to have satellite uplink or downlink, whichever way you're looking at it. Because of that, the satellites in that region become very, very vulnerable. Now, once you take out the Chinese um, communication satellites, all those missiles become obsolete. You can't use them. They're literally just like paperweights or maybe turn them into a lamp or something or get them on Alibaba Express. And, you know, people in the UK will buy them as, you know, really fancy lamps. But the first shot that would be fought in a war with China would be in space because whoever controls space in that region would actually have the a, a huge advantage in the battlefield because the, the they'd be able to control the missile systems, the missile targeting systems. China are bringing online a competitor to Elon Musk's Starlink. Now, let's be under no illusion, guys. Elon Musk's Starlink is a military application. It's for the military. It's used by the military. Um, you know, we do. Uh, that's just from my understanding of it. You know, it's used by the Ukrainian military vastly. You know, the Starlink was one of the oh, well, the Starlink and the N law, which was the British rocket launcher that they gave the Ukrainians. Those two things alone stopped the Russian invasion. It stopped it dead. Obviously, as time progressed, there were other pieces of kit and, kit and equipment that came in. People like people argue with me all the time saying, oh, but Sean, the Javelin, it's, it was a much better, it's a much better system, yada, yada, yada. No, the Javelin for taking out tanks did not work in Ukraine because a lot of the battles were fought in built-up areas. They were fought close. 
the javelin's good at out to three kilometers in open plains. And the problem in Ukraine was these these tank engagements were really, really close where the javelin doesn't doesn't succeed. Also, the javelin can't be fired from inside a building. There, you know, there's a, there's a backwash, there's rockets, you know, it just you can't fire it inside a building. The end law, you can fire that inside a building. You can also get really close to a tank before you fire that, and you're you're really successful with a kill, uh, with a K kill, sorry. The Starlink system, the huge amount of terminals that Elon Musk or SpaceX or whoever, US military, whatever you want to call it, gave the Ukrainians, that gave the Ukrainians the ability to move and maneuver and understand the battlefield and get battlefield analysis. So where they could say, you know, right, guys, you know, we've got a column coming this way. They could then divert assets, divert Barakhtar drones. Remember, back then, Barakhtar drones were being relatively successful. They've been jammed now. They don't work. So that's kind of what stopped that situation. Now, look, and that is the, that Starlight, that Star Starlink system is the only thing right now when we're talking about technology that the our adversaries don't have, guys. You know, and it's it's wild that we're saying this. Starlink is the only thing that the West have that our adversaries don't have. Our adversaries, yes, they have similar kit and equipment. Maybe it's better, maybe it's worse, but they don't have a low Earth orbit satellite communication system. They don't. So the Chinese are bringing one of these online at some point. I think they may have already started to launch their systems. But once these satellites get launched into low Earth orbit, that then changes the battlefield drastically. Because guess what? Those communications, GPS communication systems that are in low Earth orbit, that are big, that are in geostationary orbit, that control the Chinese long range missile systems. Guess what? Doesn't matter if you take them out now because the the Chinese have a low Earth orbit system that's harder to take out because if you take one of those out, there's plenty of redundancies. These satellites are a lot smaller; they're easier to launch. I mean, you can I think you can probably launch these from a balloon. You've got all these complexities now. So once that happens, it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna make things a lot harder for whoever's fighting in that conflict. But anyway, guys, back to the conflicts that are happening right now. So that's what's so I've, I've given you an update on what's gonna happen next in the Middle East. You're gonna see this, you know, you're gonna see this rhetoric, um, rhetoric on the streets, protests. You're gonna see the media jump all over it. You're gonna see uh, house resolutions come into place. And you know, I I'm not gonna rehash what I've just said. So in Ukraine, what are we gonna see? in Ukraine. Guys, Ukraine for me, if we, if you live in the United Kingdom, if you live in Europe, if you live in Ukraine, obviously, the Europe, the theatre of, the war theatre of Ukraine is the main event for you guys. Why? Because it's what everybody's going to be involved in. The Russians right now in Ukraine, the like I've just shown you on the map, guys, you know, the Russians are pushing daily. Now, it's only small ground that they're making, but day on day on day on day, guess what? It's big ground. Now, the Russians have been, I've, I've, I've said for a while that the Russians are gearing up for a, you know, for a big push. The Russians are gearing up for a big, um, you know, for a big drive into this region. I said, we're probably going to see a multi-pronged attack on all fronts. I don't know if this is happening yet. I would suspect we could be seeing the beginning of it. It's certainly within the right time frame for this to happen in the context that whatever happens, they want this to fall in line with the US election or just after the US election when nobody knows what's happening. Um, you know, in, whoever's won the US election has won the US election. So they're waiting to be inaugurated. Who's in charge of the country? Is it whoever? Is, is it Joe Biden? Is it whoever writes the teleprompter? Is it Kamala Harris? Like, like who's going to be in charge of the country at that time? So that's when whoever's going to be making this push is going to make this push. So what you'll see is you'll see more and more ground being taken in the Ukrainian front. Right now, there is absolutely nothing stopping. I mean, let me just have a quick look on the map. There's realistically, there's nothing stopping the Russians pushing all the way through and making a land bridge now right up to the river Dnipro. Yes, you've got um, the city of Dnipro. You've got the city of um, Krematorsk. You've got, yeah, you've got the city of Krematorsk. You've got Krematorsk. You've got, yeah, you've got Krematorsk. And you, yeah, you've got Krematorsk, which could be, 
totally isolated. You know, the, the Russians could, um, and you know, encircle Kremitorsk. They don't really need to, um, you know, they don't really need to take Krem Kremitorsk. They can just leave that. Further to the north, you've obviously got Kharkiv. Yeah, so, but there is literally now a straight line to the River, river Dnipro and, and Dnipro. I think they're going to make a, a headline to Dnipro. Dnipro is a city on the Dnipro. There's a lot of industrial, um, there's a lot of industry in Dnipro. There's a lot of heavy manufacturing in Dnipro. And when you're looking at these conflicts and when you're looking at like trying to understand what's happening next, you've got to think of these on a financial, um, you, you know, on a financial return. If the, you know, it, it's all well and good, the Russians taking loads of land, but if they're getting nothing in return, what is the point, what is the strategic advantage of taking that land? Well, there is none. So you want to think about towns and cities that have got parts of industry that they want. You know, in the in the east of Ukraine, there was a lot of minerals that's been extracted and those minerals are going to Russia. So that's fueling the war machine there. And then I think Putin's going to be looking at his how to bolster his economy. So I think he's going to go for Dnipro next. And guys, this is going to be a wild move if he manages to get up to or within range of Dnipro where he is now you know putin's troops are right on the edge of pokrovs they're within 10 kilometers of pokrovs now the reason they've held back i believe of pokrovs at that range is because at that range you're pretty much you know indirect fire you can you know you, you can fire 120 millimeter mortars and they are within range of pokrovs now so you don't need to um invest those large artillery pieces to suppress that location you can do that internally by you know by your infantry whoever's got a 120 millimeter mortar right guys turn your mortars on pokrovs give them um i don't know six rounds a minute or whatever whatever 120 millimeter whatever a 120 millimeter mortar can fire so once this happens, you know, and P and there's, you know, and more and more grounds being taken and the West understand they're not going to get help from the United States. We're going to see the European Union have to step up. We've already seen this um, rhetoric by what's his name? I keep forgetting how keep forgetting the British prime minister's name, uh, Keir Starmer. We keep seeing this, you know, I think they've called it the European and Keir Starmer and John Healy. They're talking about, I think it's called the European Military Alliance Scheme or something. The European, basically, it's going to be an EU army, a European Union army. And guess what? The United Kingdom will be involved. Not only will the United Kingdom be involved, but it will take a leading role. Now the United Kingdom has to take a leading role if it need, if the EU army is going to be is going to succeed. The United Kingdom has the best military in Europe, and it certainly has the best special forces by a clear mile. So the United Kingdom will take a leading role. So the United Kingdom will have the role that is the uh, force projection, the strike and grasp um, capacity, where they can drive forwards, take locations, and then other militaries will move in and take that, take and hold that location. The Polish, they are going to be the, they're going to be the, they're going to be the teeth arms, I guess. They will be the meat and veg of this European army. The French, they will be the nuclear capacity. They will be the nuclear deterrent because they've got all the nuclear knowledge. They've got all the nuclear reactors. They've got all the nuclear weapons. Remember, the French nuclear weapons are not part of NATO. Guys, it seems like this thing's been planned for a few years, doesn't it? When you look at how things are, are how the chips are falling now. The Germans, they will be the industrial might, the industrial strength. They will be producing tanks. They will be producing armor. They will be producing stuff made of metal. And that will be pushed forwards. And then, I mean, who else have we got in that region? You know, we've got the Romanians. They'll be, they'll be, they'll be, they'll be, they'll be, they'll be, they'll be uh, ground forces as well. But that's kind of how the European army is going to be, you know, is going to be structured. Now, why does the United Kingdom have to have to have a leading role? Because the United Kingdom have the best special forces and they have that best striking ability. So the United Kingdom will be going forwards. They'll be striking. They'll be taking ground. They'll be destroying enemy positions. They will be, then be relieved by Polish, Romanian forces, whoever that may be, you know, Ukrainian forces. 
and that's how you want to move how you want to move it because you can have i was always light infantry if you want to call it that parachute regiment or advanced name however you want to call it and the role of your light infantry, I mean your advanced infantry, your special specialist infantry, you want to train them to be light, you want to train them to be fast, agile, air mobile, and you want them to go in and devastate, devastate ground really quickly. But those troops that do that are not necessarily the ones you want to have to hold that ground because those troops are specialised at a task. You know, they're specialized at dawn raids. They're specialized at night attacks. They're specialized at, you know, being able to infiltrate compounds and take out enemy lo locations deep behind enemy lines. That's what they're specialized at. What they're not specialized at is heavy armor, artillery, you know, and you, you don't get people who can be specialized in all these things. So the so Britain right now, we already have that capacity. We have it with um, the various special forces units that we have. We have it with 16 air assault. You know, we have uh, we have that we have that capacity already and nobody else in Europe has that capacity. When I go around the globe and I talk about people's militaries, it's because I understand how these militaries work. I understand where they excel, where they don't excel. I understand their strengths and their weaknesses. Like I said, you know, back at talking about the Middle East, the only people that have a chance at a ground invasion in Iran is the Americans. They're the only ones. Nobody else can do it. The, the Israelis can't do it. They don't have the manpower. They don't have the logistics. They don't have, how are they, how are they going to get all the Israeli troops? into that region. Don't forget the amount of troops that you're going to need is going to be a phenomenal amount of troops. You know, if you think there was in the 2020, sorry, in the 20, not 20, in the 2000 and what was it? 2003 invasion of Iraq, I think there was six, uh, six, 600,000 troops versus the Iraqi army. It was about on on par by by numbers, but the 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 benefit that the coalition had was the vast amounts of air power. If you look at that and you say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna field the same amount of troops, just think how many meals you need to provide for six hundred thousand troops. Think about how much water you need to provide for six hundred thousand troops. Think about how much ammunition, the weight of all that stuff, and all that stuff is gonna have to go by sea. So that's why the United States are the only ones who can invade Iran. If we're looking at a war with Iran, which we know we are because of House Resolution five five nine or five five nine five nine nine, whatever it is, I'll put a link in the description. You know. That already said it, so the United States have to do that. So now you understand the type of logistics we're talking about. And people kind of don't understand this. They, you know, they see like a couple of like uh, Houthi rebels, like 20, 30 guys on the border of um, Israel with a with a load of trucks looking really mean. I'm like, right, okay, what are they going to do? Literally, what are they going to do? Nothing. They're like a reconnaissance group at best. You know, the logistics that you need to support this type of um, invasion is colossal. Now, the European theater, because nobody in the European theater has that capacity to go into Iran, why are they going to bother? They're not going to bother, are they? No. Guess what? The Europeans do have, though, a direct logistic line into Ukraine and into Russia. So they don't need amphibious landing craft. Whereas the United States, if they were to get involved in Europe, they would have to bring all their stuff over. It makes no sense logistically for the United States to get involved. And, you know, it doesn't matter what rhetoric's coming out of what politician's mouth. It doesn't matter. It's all pomp and circus because they don't know what they're talking about, because they don't know what they're talking about, because they've never done that. They've never been there. They don't know. They just don't know that. Oh, we're going to we're going to give this much money. Right. Money's right now, guys, where we are in the world, in our evolution. Money makes no sense. It's not even it's not even a factor anymore. They're just going to print more money. They're just going to keep printing and printing and printing and printing and printing and printing until everything's over. Somebody's decided that they're a winner. And, and then that's it. Then we're going to we'll probably have a global currency and a global government. And it's just going to be it's going to be wild anyway. So. That's kind of what's happening. You know, that's why the United Kingdom will have to take that leading role because they've got the strike capacity and nobody else in Europe has that strike capacity and you always have to lead from the front. So if the United Kingdom have sent 16 air assault brigade in to do, uh, you know, to clear a town, a city, a location, whatever, 
it will be 16 air assault that will be giving the orders initially until somebody takes over. Now, that's why the United Kingdom is going to have to take the leading role in this conflict, whatever whatever way, shape or form that develops into. Anyway, guys, I think I've gone around the clock and given you an update on what's going to be happening in the next couple of Next couple of weeks, months, I, I, I don't know. This has to happen quickly into the US presidency if you look at the election cycle. Um, the way that the mainstream media have been highlighting this woman, this naked woman in Iran, it leads me to believe this is going to be accelerated. The situation on the ground in Ukraine, as I just showed you from the map, guys, it's not the, the Russians are taking ground every day. And even though it's a little bit of ground every day, it's still ground every day. And over a week, over a month, guess what, sweet cheeks? That adds up. So anyway, guys, that's the situation. That's how it's going to pan out. The United Kingdom is going to lead NATO or the European army, whatever it is, in the east of Ukraine. I don't wish this was true, guys. I genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, I wish we could be a space-faring nation and we could put all our competitivity into taking, like, can you imagine right now, like, the first, rather than, rather than having these wars, if we said, right, okay, why don't we have another space race to take the first asteroid and whoever takes the first asteroid gets all the gold on it. I mean, there's asteroids that are near earth objects that are just flying pyres. And they, you know, some of these are to be estimated to have trillions of dollars worth of gold on it. There's enough money to go around, but the problem is nobody wants to do that because making, having wars as quick money, it's fast money. We're in this part of our evolution right now where we, you know, where, where a global conflict of an industrial scale is, it seems inevitable. And this is just one of the things we're just going to have to watch it. We're, we've got front row tickets, guys, and we are watching this in HD. So anyway, guys, I'm going to Mac to Grid and I'm going to get you a vi another video later.